All right, buenos dias, mis amigos. All right, so in this video, I'm just going to address this one comment by Gigi and hope to bring some clarity, okay? All right, so now uh, we're having a great discussion on Revelation 20 and this idea of Jesus reigning a thousand years after he returns. All right, so let's just start off by reading Gigi's comment. Okay, so I said, When Jesus returns, we are lifted up in the air to meet the Lord. Then fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours all the unsaved. Gigi says, Show me the scripture. Okay. Um... To me, that's an interesting comment or interesting request because that's what I've been doing for a while, showing all the scripture from Genesis to Revelation, starting with Genesis 3, verse 15, when the, when, uh, the Lord said to the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. This is talking clearly about the end of this world. When we are lifted up in the air to meet the Lord, and God is going to destroy all the unsaved. And this is echoed all throughout the Bible. Okay. It's, um, it's incredible. Because there's no ambiguity here. It's crystal clear. It's crystal clear. Jesus returns with the armies of heaven. Okay, so now you, now you have to define the armies of heaven, because when Jesus comes, what's he do? He sends his angels to gather together the elect. And that's the same thing that we're reading in Genesis 3, verse 15, when we are lifted up. Lifted up, gathered together up in the air. And then our enemy is destroyed at our feet. It's the same thing. All right. Now, this here, many of whom were beheaded, okay, and have their glorified bodies. All right, so. Here we got a problem. Because all the unsaved will be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. We're all changed from corruptible to incorruptible, from mortal to immortal. The people who are alive at the time and believe are called up to the clouds. This is the same moment in time. There's only one resurrection. There's only one end of the world. I don't know how that... I, honest to God, I don't know how that's so hard to understand. Alright, so... Christ is the first fruits. Alright, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept? For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits. Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end. Okay. There's no wiggle room 
for two returns of the Christ because it's it goes against logic. You can't have Christ return in the clouds of heaven and then Christ return again in the heaven in the clouds of heaven. All right, so maybe it'll help. If I say it this way, okay, so in your scenario, Gigi, that you got from other men, you didn't get it from the Bible anywhere at all. I can't point to the Bible to help your idea, okay, because it doesn't exist in the Bible. In your scenario, you have Jesus Christ coming and... Then I maybe I should find specifically where you say that there will be headless people with you know beheaded people who will be resurrected, okay, on the earth, and you'll have you have resurrected people and unsaved people with Jesus on the earth okay then you have Christ returning in the clouds of heaven so now you got two Christ okay now the okay so when Christ returns and fire comes down from God and devours all of them that are below, you have God devouring Christ and all the saved people. If Christ is up in the air and fire comes down from God out of heaven, and Christ is also on the earth, that fire is going to destroy everybody. In your scenario, you got Christ on the earth, and then fire coming down from God out of heaven. It's not that complicated. Okay? Alright, so let's continue. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Alright, so right now, we have those of us that are alive, and that are saved. And then there are those that are in the grave who are saved. And we're not preventing them at all. From being saved at the end of the world from being transformed into their glorified body all right first the dead in Christ shall rise then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord all right And, um, you know, I, I'm not sure what your For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout of the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Okay. The, the voice of the archangel, same as Revelation 20. And then you quote the first five verses, and I'm not sure. Um, because in Revelation 20, when Jesus returns in the clouds of heaven, this moment when the voice of the archangel... Okay. Uh, the voice of the archangel... With the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. This is parallel with verse 11. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat upon it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found 
no place for them okay all right so this all here after the thousand years okay and then I will make them to come and worship before thy feet this is when we are lifted up in the air and the enemy is gathered below us at our feet they are not burned up if they are worshiping at our feet all right so in Revelation 3 verse 9 Let's go to it. Okay. In Revelation 3, verse 9, it says, Behold, I will make them of the syn synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. All right, so they're gonna know it. They're gonna know it, no question about it. So go back to Genesis 3, verse 15. Okay, this is a direct parallel. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. All right, so we got the scenario where God is going to stomp his foot on the head of the serpent. This is the same thing, the same moment in time. I will make them to come and worship before thy feet. We're up in the air with the Lord. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. We're up in the air with the Lord. All right. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet. So we're up in the air, and they're at our feet. We're up in the heaven in the clouds with the Lord when Jesus comes he comes in the clouds of heaven we are lifted up and our enemy is gathered at our feet they are at our feet behold I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee all right so when they are gathered at our feet, then God stomps his foot on the head of the serpent, destroying all evil forever. This is the same thing when it says, And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. This is the same thing that we're reading in Genesis. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. See, when this happens, we're not on the earth. We're up in the air with the Lord. When Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, we are up in the air with the Lord. All right. When fire comes down from heaven, we're up in the air. Fire's not going to come down on us that are saved. It's going to come down on them that are not saved. All right. 1 Corinthians 15. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. See, we're up in the air. They are at our feet. Okay. And this is echoed all throughout the Bible. All right, so go to Psalm 110. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. See, we're up in the air. Our enemy is gathered at our feet. 
and God stomps his foot on the head of the serpent, destroying all evil forever. All right, the same thing. Fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them. All right, same thing. Same moment in time. All right. So now let's go to 2 Peter chapter 3. We're going to see another parallel. All right, so when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, it's the same thing as the day of the Lord. It's the same moment in time. And uh, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Now this is parallel with what we're reading when Jesus says no man knoweth the day or the hour right? he comes as a thief in the night but of that day and hour knoweth no man no not the angels of heaven but my father only watch therefore for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the son of man cometh All right, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. It's the same thing that we're reading in Revelation 20, when fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them. Right, this is when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven which is at the end of the thousand years okay all right so it's the same moment in time okay seeing that all these things shall be dissolved what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of the lord wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the element shall melt with fervent heat now think about this when jesus comes in the clouds of heaven and everything on earth and and in the heavens are burned up okay how then why why would you think the unsaved are still going to be alive all right why, why would you think that? Why would you teach that? I mean, why would you think that, let alone teach that? Okay, so when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, I mean, consider Matthew 24. He's asked, what is the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And at the end of the world, the sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. It's the same moment in time. It's the same thing. All right, Revelation 20. From whose face the earth and heaven fled away. We know that the earth that is now is going to be destroyed, not by water, but it is reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. All right? Same thing. Reserved unto fire. All right? And fire come down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Okay? Same thing. Okay, so this scenario that Jesus comes back and only some people are resurrected that are saved and then they're on earth and what they're you know president of the united states and um so instead of um barack obama now it's jesus or maybe it's you right or somebody without a head you know, because in your scenario, you got headless people resurrected, while the rest of the people that are saved 
haven't been resurrected yet. All right, so this is why I call it the zombie doctrine. All right, so you got headless saved people, people that are saved without a head on earth, and you got President Jesus, or President Jesus, right? And then you got unsaved people, right? You got unsaved people living with President Jesus and headless leaders. I, I'm telling you, I don't like this scenario. I don't like it at all. And then you got Jesus coming back. Essentially, you got Jesus on earth, and you got Jesus coming in the clouds of heaven. And then you got the end of the world on top of the end of the world. You got, well, the end of the world comes, and then the end of the world comes again at the same time that Jesus has already come, and, and then he comes again. You got two. Jesus returns. You got two ends of the world. Why is it so hard to connect the dots? Can't you see that when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, it's the end of the world? It's the great day of the Lord? It's the same thing. On the great day of the Lord is the end of the world. This is when we are resurrected. We are lifted up in the air to meet the Lord. It's the same, same moment in time. So, knowing this, that when Jesus comes, that the heavens and the earth will be burned up, then there's going to be a new earth and a new heavens. So you can't have unsaved people living after Jesus returns. It's contrary to everything that we're reading all throughout the scripture from Genesis to Revelation. All right, so you said this is a contradiction. It's, it's not a contradiction at all. You can't have a scenario where Jesus returns and our enemy is not destroyed. I will make them to come and worship before thy feet. We're up in the air. Our enemy is at our feet, and fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them all. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. They are at our feet at the end of the world. And when that moment comes, they're going to know that God has loved us. And they will be destroyed. They will die the second death. It will be made known to them that are not saved, that God loves us, and that we are saved. It's going to be known. All right, in Matthew 24, verse 41, And knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two shall be in the field, and one shall be taken, and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, but one shall be taken, the other left. Yeah. When Jesus comes, he'll come as a thief in the night, at a time when no one expects. Just like it was in the days of Noah, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the flood waters came and took them all away. It's the same thing. When Jesus comes, those of us that are saved are lifted up in the air. Those that are not saved are at our feet. 
All right, and so this is uh, supportive. I don't know. It does not say one will be taken and another burned up. Well, that's what's going to happen to him. Right. That's what's going to happen to him. And the But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and ungodly men. And this is the same thing being echoed all throughout the Bible. All right. Jesus makes a parable of the wheat and the tares where he talks about the harvest being the end of the world and at the harvest he's going to gather together the tares bind them in bundles to burn them okay so the tares represent the unsaved all right so in Matthew 24 when it talks about one shall be taken the other left the ones that are left are the unsaved they will be burned once this harvest is completed and this all the saved are lifted up into the air to meet the Lord in the air we're up in the air the unsaved are at our feet then fire comes down from God and devours them all right this is clearly at the end of the world, which is after the thousand years are expired. Okay? It's pretty simple. It really is. Where the confusion comes in is when you have men teaching this idea that there's coming a thousand bonus years. Where I guess they teach that uh, they're going to be in the resurrected, glorified bodies, living among unsaved people, and pointing their fingers at them. And then the little dirty secret is that these people think that in this scenario, they will be having sex with unsaved women. They will be in their glorified bodies as though they were 18 years old and having sex with unsaved women. That's the dirty little secret. Very few want to talk about it. That's exactly why they teach this. It's because of the lust of their heart they're putting their hope in a thousand year period where they will have the power and authority to have sex with whoever they want. That's what it's about. And that's exactly what the Bible warns us against in the last days. Alright, in the last days. In the last days. Knowing this first, oh, I could have just did this. I could have just did this, all right? I could have just did this. Knowing this first, all right, first, the very first, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts. All right, scoffers walking after their own lust. Knowing this first, okay, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time. That's where we're at right now. Who should walk after their own ungodly lust. So this is what they're teaching. They're teaching this perversion of the heart. 
of this bonus 1,000 years where, where they're going to be in their glorified immortal bodies living among mortals and pointing their finger at them and having sex with whoever they want. That's the only reason that they teach this. It's the only reason. Because that's what they want. Because that's what their heart wants. Because they're evil inside. Evil men. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. Deceiving and being deceived. You think the Bible's lying? Do you? You think that's not true? Is that what you believe? That we can't trust the Bible? You said it does not say one will be taken, another burned up. Well, that's the consequence of not being saved. All right, you're going to get burned up, okay? Again, Jesus is the first resurrection. And, yeah, I mean, I, I could show you the direct quote, but if you don't believe it, what, if you don't believe the Bible, you know, what, what good is this going to do you? To show you Jesus saying very plainly, I am the resurrection. But these evil men and seducers, they say, no, no, no. Jesus is not the resurrection. I'm the first resurrection. And I will be resurrected in my glorified body, pointing my finger at unsaved people and having sex with them, denying the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, that's exactly what they're doing. All right, and I'm trying to help. I'm trying to help. Make this very clear. I mean, really, why beat around the bush? Why not just tell you exactly the way it is? Why should I hold anything back if I care about you, right? Again, Jesus is the first resurrection. The Bible is very clear about this. Well, obviously, we are talking about many people being resurrected. All, all, the, all the saved people, all the saved people will be resurrected. Yeah, that's crystal clear. All the saved people will be resurrected. And Daniel 12, verse 2 it says, Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. This happens at the end of the world. And it's interesting because Daniel talks so much about the end of the world, about how there's four kingdoms. And then after the fourth kingdom is the fifth kingdom, all right, which comes at the end of the world. That fifth kingdom is coming. We're in that fourth kingdom right now. And it's all kinds of filthy. And people are just so used to it. They don't see how wicked this world it has become. All right. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. All right, so if you understand that the thrones and they that sit upon them it's talking about saved people right now. Okay. 
you understand that, then you ought to be able to understand what it's talking about there in Revelation 20. All right, then I'm going to show you two verses here. Let's start with Ephesians 2. All right. Verse 6, uh, maybe I should start here. Uh, Even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and has raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Right now we sit on thrones, heavenly thrones right now okay right now we sit on thrones the judgment of God which is eternal life for us it's already been given to us those of us that are saved God can't take back what he has already given us he's given us eternal life he'll never take that away never judgment is established for Ever. Okay, now if you would have read Revelation 1, which I highly recommend, you would have seen that Jesus has made us kings and priests unto God. Right now, we are kings and priests unto God right now. And if you would have known your Bible, this, you know, it's interesting to me. Thou art a master of Israel and knoweth not these things? That the children of Israel were a kingdom of priests? You didn't know that? Well, what about... I, I mean, have you read the Bible at all? You, you're a master of Israel and you don't know these things? But right now, we that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are a royal priesthood. You didn't know that? You didn't know that right now we're kings and priests unto God? You didn't know that. You are master of Israel. And you didn't know that Jesus has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus? You didn't know that? Thou art a master of Israel? Uh, you should have known that. You should have known that. Okay. So, GG, consider what the Bible says. After the thousand years is finished, the rest of the dead are judged from the books, and there is a new heaven and a new earth. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. So consider that right there. Consider that. That would indicate that New Jerusalem, if it's coming down from God or coming down out of heaven, then New Jerusalem right now is in heaven. Okay. Make sense? I think about that. I mean, this is important stuff. And every detail matters. Every detail matters. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. All right. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven that means Jerusalem is above doesn't it I mean you can't get around it so in Revelation 20 and when you read and they went up on the breath of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about in the beloved city where's that beloved city at knowing what I just showed you Jerusalem, which is above, right? In what you quoted, right? The holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. Knowing that, 
And then, reading Revelation 20, can't you put it together? When thou art a master of Israel, and you knoweth not these things, that this beloved city is in heaven. And so at the end of the world, we are lifted up in the air. Right? We're lifted up in the air and our enemy is gathered at our feet. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about. They're at our feet. They're below us, at our feet. We're up in the air. Jerusalem is above. You see that? Jerusalem is above. You quoted the holy city coming down from God out of heaven. The city is above, the beloved city, it's Jerusalem, and there's not another city. That's the city. It's above. So when fire comes down from God out of heaven, it's destroying them that are not saved. After the thousand years are expired. Okay? And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God, God himself, the Father. Until you can wrap your head around the fact that Jesus is the Son of God, this will seem like a contradiction. All right, so Jesus is the Father, okay? Gee, there's only one God. It's Jesus. There aren't two gods, all right? And also, i gotta, I got to say this, but Satan is not a god. There's one God, and it's Jesus. If you don't understand it now, you're going to find out later, one way or the other. There's one God. It's Jesus. Also, you still have not explained this. Who lives and reigns with Christ for a thousand years? It's those of us that are saved. I've said it three or four or five times. Every time you ask, I say the same thing. It's those of us that are born of the Spirit of God. Right? When did the thousand years start? It started... When Jesus laid down his life. Okay. It started when we. Are. Um, when Jesus resurrected. And we that are Christ. Have the spirit. Of God in us. Okay so. This goes back to. You know. Uh, John 14 and so on. Um, let's do it this way. Let's do it this way. Um, no, 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 let's do it this way. Alright, so. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Right here, we can start here. We can start here. Oh, let me just do it this way. And I, and I will pray the Father, he, he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. But the, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, same thing. Whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeds from the Father, he shall testify of me. Nevertheless, I will tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Alright, so now we have the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Truth in us. Alright, so that's important. And so now Jesus uh, abides in us. Give me a second here to think about this. Oh. 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 Let me think about this. Hold on a second. All right. 
so what's that verse in is it John 14 15 16 where we are one as they are one let me see that gonna be gonna be a lot there so let me do it this way all right let me just kind of scroll down here and now I am no more in the world but these are in the world and I come to thee Holy Father keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me that they may be one as we are and glorify and the I'm sorry and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them that they may be one even as we are one now that's one more verse I wanted to share all right one more verse I wanted to share I got to think about this here I got to think about this but maybe no 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 maybe I do it this way do it this way see what happens here I just there's one word that I can't that I want to add to it and I just can't really abide in me and I in you I mean that's is that the that might actually, that might actually be all right so if we go to John 15 all right I am the true vine and my father is the husband's men every branch in me that beareth not fruit he takes away and every branch that bears fruit he purges it that it may bring forth more fruit now ye are clean through the word which i have spoken unto you abide in me and i in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except to abide in the vine no more can ye except ye abide in me i am the vine ye are the branches he that abideth in me and i in him the same bring forth much fruit without me ye can do nothing all right, so Jesus abides in us, and we abide in him, okay? No question about it. We that are born of God, we have Jesus living in us. Okay, so... Just consider, consider that fact, okay. Let me think about this. There's just one more verse. One more verse I wanted to share. Oops, uh, yep, yep, yep. Okay, one more verse. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world, thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. And the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. Okay. So again, we are one with Jesus. We have him abiding in us. And we abide in him. I think that's very important. Very important to understand. Is it not? I mean, really. Okay. Very, very important. Okay. Once you are born of the Spirit of God, it would be foolish to think that God does not abide in you. If you have eternal life, you're going to live forever, then of course... The Spirit of God abides in you, and you in the Spirit. Okay? God Himself, Father, until you can wrap your head around. Okay. Also, use. Okay, so who lives and reigns with Christ a thousand years? 
Uh, when did it start? It started upon um, the death and resurrection, the death, resurrection, and ascension to heaven. All right, so Jesus ascended to heaven, and he is, and now uh, we are living in this unique time period where Jesus has laid down his life. He has resurrected from the dead. He has ascended to heaven with a promise to return. This is a unique time period. That's what Revelation 20 is referring to. And anybody that teaches any different is ignorant. Okay. Thou art a master of Israel and knoweth not these things. I mean, I w really. You think Jesus dying was no big deal? Just another event in a series of events in the world? No, man, I'm telling you, it's a huge deal. The biggest, arguably the biggest event in the world. The biggest event the world has ever seen. Jesus laying down his life is greater than the flood of Noah. And the fact that Jesus resurrected and ascended to heaven with the promise that he will return. I mean, how great is that? Is there anything greater that's ever happened in the history of the world? No. It's not even close, Jack. Not even close, Gigi. When does the thousand years end? It's clear that when when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, it's the end of that's what that's the end of the thousand years. Because when Jesus returns, then we are changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. We are no longer in this mortal flesh. We will have put on immortality. Therefore, we are no longer in this time period. Why only a thousand years? Well, I'm telling you, I, I don't want to live in this, this body. This wretched body forever and what's your why only a thousand years I, I, I think a thousand years seems to be too long I'm ready to go home now why only a thousand years are you enjoying this world I mean, really why only a thousand years you want it to be longer you want pain suffering death to ex be extended Why only a thousand years? And First John chapter 2, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Why only a thousand years? You, what, you love the world? You want this thing to continue? Pain, death, sorrow, suffering? You want it, you want it to go on and on and on? I don't. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away in the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. All right. And you are changing the meaning of reign and save to suit your narrative. Okay, so you cannot be reigning with Christ and not saved. You cannot be saved and not reigning with Christ. These are... Uh, they You can't break them apart. Okay? It's just, you saved, you have eternal life. You can't, you can't be saved and not have eternal life. You can't have eternal life and not be saved. Right, you can't break those apart. It's the same thing. Right, I mean, it's, it goes along with being saved. <clears throat> I mean, that's inseparable. Inseparable. There's no possible way 
to be saved and not be reigning with Christ. Because for one, you have Christ living in you. You got the God, you got God living in you. You abide in him and he abides in you. You have to be reigning. If you're not reigning, then you're not saved. If you're saved, you have to be reigning with Christ. Now, the problem is when you imagine the scenario where you're changed into your glorified body, living among unsaved people in their mortal bodies, and you're pointing your finger at them and having sex with them. That's, the, that's not what reign means. Now, you gave the definition of reign, and nowhere does that fit your narrative. <laughs> that you're going to be pointing your finger at unsaved people while you're in your mortal body. That's never going to happen. There's not going to be a thousand year, a thousand bonus years of guilt-free sex or whatever you're dreaming about. It's not going to happen. There's not going to be a thousand years of people running around without a head. Uh, that's comic book stuff. It's never, ever going to happen. All right. <clears throat> All right, so... The Bible is clear. I can post scripture after scripture and you just come up with reigning with Christ and being saved is the same thing when we are saved. Reigning with Christ and being saved is the same thing when we are saved. Jesus abides in us and we in him. Jesus abides in us and we in him. Yes. How You can't be you can't have Jesus abiding in you and you not reigning with Christ. I mean, you've got to be strongly, willingly ignorant. You've got to be stupid on purpose. Really. To say, yeah, Jesus abides in me, but I'm not reigning with Jesus. Well, then you're saying Jesus doesn't reign. There's no logical thought put into it, man. None at all. These are inseparable. Jesus Christ reigns right now and forever. Forever and ever, and ever and ever, and ever and ever. Okay, forever and ever. All right, he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. I right, said, so why are you teaching a thousand years? Are you going to reign for a thousand years and the party's over? No, no, no. That's, that's not what the Bible talks about at all. Jesus reigns forever. <laughs> yeah, oh, my goodness. Wow. Okay. All right, reigning with Christ and being saved is the same thing. No, this is madness. Well, you got to be out of your cotton pick in mind. Reigning with Christ and being saved is the same thing. If Jesus is reigning right now, and Jesus abides in you right now, then you are reigning with Christ right now. Simple logic. Yeah, it can't be any other way. If you say Jesus, wait, Jesus isn't reigning, then you're calling the Bible a lie. All right. He reigns forever right now. And so if he reigns forever right now and he abides in you, then you reign with Christ. Okay. And they lived and reigned with Christ. Right? And they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him. So Jesus reigns forever. Forever. And so if Jesus abides in you and he reigns forever, then you also reign with him. Him. With. Him. You reign with. 
him. And they lived and reigned with Christ. Right? And they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him. What do you think? You were going to reign all by yourself? Is that what you thought? You're going to stick your finger out and point it at people? Is that what you thought that meant? You give the definition of reign, and nowhere does that fit your narrative. Nowhere at all. Okay? You say it's madness. Is madness that Jesus is reigning right now and forever? Is that madness? Or is it madness to think that Jesus abides in me? I know he does. I know Jesus abides in me. No question about it. And therefore, knowing that Jesus reigns forever, then, and he abides in me, then I know that I reign with Christ. During this time period and forever. During this time period because I'm still in this wretched body. All right? And at when he comes in the clouds of heaven, it's the end of the thousand years. It's the end of me being in this wretched body. Whether it happens today or 999 years from now, whatever. I know it's going to happen. There is no doubt in my mind. It's going to happen. This world's coming to an end. And when it comes to an end, then are we lifted up into the air to meet the Lord so shall we ever be with the Lord. We'll be changed. Trans we'll be uh, changed in the twinkling of an eye. Put on incorruption. We'll put on immortality at that time. And that will last forever. Not a thousand years. It will last for all eternity. You are not reigning. I am reigning. But while Christ is reigning... Because Christ reigns forever, I reign with him. The world is full of lies, my, no question about it. I'm trying to help you see through the lies. You control and reign over nothing. I, no, Jesus reigns. And I reign with him. I reign with him. Let's go back to Revelation 20. Is it me reigning or is it Jesus reigning? It's Jesus reigning and I reign with him. Because he abides in me and I abide in him. They lived and reigned with Christ. But they shall be priests of God and, and of Christ and shall reign with him. Jesus reigns. And because he abides in me, I reign with, with, with Christ. With him with him alright where you so th think about this what you're saying oh this is madness you're not reigning the, you control and reign over nothing so what you're saying is that you think that when the world comes to an end or no, I don't know whatever you, okay, you think when this thousand years this thousand your time period. You think that there's going to be a thousand years where you're going to be reigning. You're going to control and reign over everything. That's what you're saying. When you try to lay that on me, this is what you're putting on yourself. This idea that there's coming a time when you're going to own this effing place. And I'm telling you, that's never going to happen. You're not in control. You're not going to have control and a reign over anything. Jesus is in control. Jesus reigns. And we that are his reign with him now and forever. God is in control. All right. You are doing none of that. That is the definition of reign from the KJV. Well, it's the King James Bible, not the King James Version. It's the Bible. It's the Word of God. It comes from heaven. I want to make that crystal clear. It's not man's interpretation, it's God. 
the Word of God. Okay. And if you don't believe that, then that might be the root of your problem. Okay. You don't believe the Bible you hold in your hands? Why would you expect to understand what it says if you don't believe it? Okay. Now, um, I'm not doing any of what? This is the definition of rain. Well, again, we go back to Revelation 20. <laughs> uh, it's like it's there. It's right there. What if I... How do I do the magnifying? Magnif if I did the magnifier, can I do the magnifier? Is there a way to do the magnifier? I guess not. Okay. No. I don't know. Okay. You see this word? Right there, W-I-T-H, with. Very important. Okay. But it's very important. See, they live and reign with Christ. It's not they live, <clears throat> excuse me, it's not saying they live and reign with all power and authority. And Christ is just kind of pushed to the side. That's it doesn't say that at all, right? Now, again, they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign all by themselves. They put just push Jesus to the side and you take them, move on over, right? Tell him to move on over, and you now you're taking over. Is that what you thought? I mean, that seems to be what you're indicating, that you're going to push Jesus to the side and you're going to have control over everything and you're going to reign. You're going to be the new boss. Isn't that exactly what you're saying? Huh? You think you're going to push Jesus to the side and you're going to control and reign over the whole dang place now that's what it seems to be it seems to me that that's what you're saying you are doing none of that well is Jesus is Jesus reigning right now now think about it because if Jesus is reigning right now and we that are saved are reigning with him and you, now you're putting yourself outside of that when you say with your own words that you're not reigning if you're not reigning then you're not saved by your own words your own words that come out of your mouth or out, out of your fingers whatever by your own words. If you say you're not reigning with Christ. You're saying you're not saved. These are inseparable. Inseparable. Does Christ abide in you? If he abides in you. Does he reign? Yeah, he does. Does he reign for a thousand years? No. He reigns for ever. So why would you put your hope into a thousand bonus years when we're being offered eternal Life. Life that lasts forever.